Good morning. Welcome back to the Outreach of the Heart Ministries. I come to you live from the salt plant in Redmond, Utah. I will load here tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Arrived here last night about 9.30, 9.45, somewhere in there. Kind of lose track. Um, my load Monday will take me back towards Nebraska with a stop in Callaway, brief stop just to unload and then roll right on through um, with the second half of my load being delivered up in northeast Nebraska. And then I'm not sure where I'm going from there, but I do know that I will be back home next weekend next weekend, which for a change, I'm actually looking forward to. Tomorrow I begin week number five out here on the road since I've been home. And, and uh, that's quite a long time, folks. That's quite a long time. So looking forward to, to getting home for a few days, Monday and Tuesday of this following week, March 6 and 7. I've got work scheduled for to be done to the truck. So that's definitely going to keep me home for for an extra couple of days. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yesterday I got a chance to deliver to a gold mine, an actual gold mine in Nevada. I won't say where it was. I won't give you any details, but it's interesting some of the places I get to go. But my dispatcher this morning, as I communicated with him, I said, please put this on a do not deliver to list. Uh, it was less than a desirable experience. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, beautiful place, but not very good conditions. So with all of that, I'm good, glad to be here. I'm glad you're here as well. So we're going to be talking about this topic of being committed to the Lord. How many of you right now could actually say that, yes, I am fully committed to the Lord? Well, what, what does that mean? What does it mean to be committed to the Lord? Well, we make commitments to the Lord, do we not? And even sometimes we say, well, Lord, if you will do such and such, then I will do such and such. Well, that's not a commitment to the Lord. That's bargaining with the Lord. A much different aspect of what than what we're talking about today. It is not good to bargain with the Lord. Lord, if you will provide this, then I will do this for you. God doesn't bargain with us. He desires our full commitment unto himself. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to look at a couple of examples. And, and for the first time in a long time, there's, we're going to stay primarily just in the Old Testament. One scripture comes out of the New Testament, Hebrews 11.30. Just one simple little verse. And it talks about our faith. Faith in, involved with our commitment. And we'll, we'll understand that more as we approach that scripture. So would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together with you. Thank you for safety in my travels and the opportunity to be in a place where there's, there's good enough cell service to be able to present a message. On your behalf, Lord, I lift this message up to you. I lift those who hear this message up to you. And Lord, I pray that this message will sink into the hearts, the minds, the ears, and their very innermost being of those who hear. May their souls be changed, set ablaze, set on fire. But Lord, we know that you work in mysterious ways. We don't understand your ways. 
we don't always understand why you do the things that you do. But this day, Lord, we'll take the time to try and understand. So as we feel that conviction that, that is in us, we understand that it is you not punishing us, but healing us from our illness, from our sickness. Not a physical illness, not a physical sickness in this case. But the illness that leads to death, eternal separation from you. That illness is called sin. Lord, when we commit ourselves to other things rather than to you, than to you we begin to love those other things more than we do you. And you tell us in your word, we shall have no other gods before you. And you tell us that the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So today, Lord, as we listen to this message, may it stir in us to transfer the love that we have for others, other things in our life, those other things that have become a priority rather than you, Lord. May we slide them down the ladder a little bit and put you at the top so we may focus on you and our commitment to you, Lord. Again, Lord, we take a moment to speak against the evil one. And in the name of Jesus, Satan, you have no authority. You are commanded in the name of Jesus Christ to stand down. Stand down in the hearts of those who hear. And stand down here in this place. Where you think you may be able to prevent this message from going out. But Lord, you, Satan, you have no, no rights, no abilities unless the Lord grants them to you. And at this moment, Satan, in the name of Jesus, you are commanded to get lost. I thank you, Lord, for, for this opportunity once again. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to have quite a bit of reading this morning, a couple of different stories to see if we can somehow relate to this topic of commitment to the Lord. Well, we're going to start off with Proverbs 16, verse 3. Proverbs 16, verse 3. This word commit comes right up. Commit to the Lord whatever you do. Okay, so we're already convicted. We're already feeling inadequate. We're already feeling like we're failures. Because we know we don't commit everything to the Lord. We don't commit to the Lord whatever we do. Face it, folks, we think we can do it alone. We think we can do it alone. Can we? No. The Lord's hand is in everything, whether we want to admit it or not. And we're going to find that out in, in these two stories that I, I share with you this morning. So Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you. Why then do we not commit everything that we do unto the Lord? Because he has the perfect master plan in store. Oh, well, it's just a little thing. You know what? In the eyes of God, even the little things are big things. Even the little things are big things. So no matter how small you think your, your plans are, your commitment to whatever you want to do is, 
God is bigger than them plans. So why not commit everything, whatever we do, unto the Lord? And He will establish our plans. To me, that is so reassuring as I go through this life. I've tried to do it on my own, and it failed miserably. Sure, I had some success here and there. But the emptiness that remained, even even in the midst of, of success, when my plans worked out, they just still seemed so empty. But when we let the Lord lead our plans, let the Lord have authority over our life rather than ourselves having that authority. The fulfillment of life is intensified beyond what words can describe. Beyond what words can describe. Well, let's turn back a few pages to the the book of Psalm, chapter 37. Psalm chapter 37, verses 5 and 6. Again, this word commit is at the beginning of this scripture. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. And he will do this. He will do this. What what is it that he's going to do? Well, let's let's look at verse 6. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. So, maybe we're asking ourselves, so if I commit to the Lord, he's going to make me shine like the noonday sun. Whoopee, I don't want to stand out in a crowd. I, I don't care that God's light is shining on me so others can see. Many of you are are happy just to be sitting in a corner watching everything go by. But that's not what God's plan for you is. God's plan for you is for you to take your faith, which has led to your belief, which has led to your salvation, your eternal life in heaven, and share it with others. Remember that little song that says, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Are you letting this little light of Christ shining in you, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine? Or are you trying to hide it under a bushel basket? What does God say about hiding it under the bushel basket? Are you, are you embarrassed because of your relationship with Jesus? Because you stand out in a crowd? Well, folks, if we're embarrassed or we're afraid to let this little light of mine shine, that little light is the light of Jesus Christ living in us. If we're afraid to let that little light shine, It's really hard for us to be committed to Jesus Christ. To be committed to following the decrees of God. To be committed to allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Are you willing to be committed to the Lord? Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. We go back to Proverbs and we look at chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. So we've got this word trust, we've got this word faith, we've got this word believe, 
all are parts of being able to make a commitment to the Lord and staying committed to the Lord. We go back to Psalm. This time we look in verse 20. Psalm verse 20. Psalm chapter 20, excuse me. Verse 4. says, May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. Now this, this is the scripture that really separates the committed Christians to the well, I'm saved and that's good enough for me. No desire to serve the Lord. No desire to grow in the relationship with the Lord. Yeah, I know him. I believe. I'm saved. And I go on with life. Now, where do we read this in, in, in this verse? May he give you the desire of your heart. Those of us who are committed to the Lord do not desire the pleasures of our own heart. We do not have the desires of our heart. We have the desires of God's heart. Do you have the desire of God's heart driving you, holding you fast, keeping you on that narrow road that leads to life? How committed are you? Sure, all of us, even those of us who are, are most faithfully committed, still at times have the desire of our heart. And when that desire of our heart is not fulfilled, we begin to question. We begin to allow the devil to have a foothold. Our commitment becomes strained, and it happens in an instant. We pray for something that we really want. We, we expect something to happen that doesn't. And we rebel. We rebel in our own little way so many times. But just because we've rebelled, does that mean that we can't come back to the Lord? Absolutely not. No matter how many steps away in, in rebellion that you've taken, there's only one step that's required to return back to God. And that step is a U-turn. A word called repentance. To turn around to turn away from, to return to. How many of you are in need of severe repentance right now? What did this say? May he give you the desire of your heart and make all, make all your plans succeed. What happens if your, your plans don't succeed? We begin to question. We begin to doubt. And again, we give the devil a foothold. So as promised, we're going to look at a couple of different stories. Turn with me to the book of Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. And we're going to begin looking in chapter 20 with verse 1. Now, there's some names in here that I'm probably not going to pronounce right. There's some sections of this scripture that I'm probably just going to pass through. Let's say, read it yourself because some of these names are are a little bit are a little bit tough. But you'll you'll understand 
as we go through this. Second Chronicles, beginning in chapter 20, verse 1. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, with some of the Meonites, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazon Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. So in this alarm, Jehoshaphat didn't turn to his own will. He didn't turn to his own wishes, his own desire of his heart. Where did he turn? He turned to the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek the Lord. Verse 5, Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, The God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have not lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary. They have lived in it. And have built in it a sanctuary for you, for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague of famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name, and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now, here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of their possession, out of the possession you gave us as an an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. Verse 13. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite, a descendant of Esau, as he stood in the assembly. Like I said, a lot of hard names. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but is God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jerel. You will not have to fight this battle. A little bit of confusion here. You will not have to fight this battle. Go down to meet them, but you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your possessions. Positions, not possessions. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face him tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Now verse 20. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. 
Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. Verse 23, the Amorites, Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Sir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Sir, they helped to destroy one another. Verse 24, when the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. Now, why is that story important? That story is important because all of us are facing battles. All of us are facing battles. And the Lord gives direction on how to stand against those battles. He also tells us in his word that the battle belongs to the Lord. It belongs to me. You're just a part of that battle. And in this particular case... The army of the Israelites took their positions, but never swung a sword, and they won the victory. They won the victory. Why? Because they trusted God. They had faith. They didn't turn to their own will. They didn't turn to their own desires of their heart. They turned to their commitment to God. Not only did they turn to their commitment to God, but also to God's commitment to them. What is God's commitment to you? Again, we go back to Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's what God's plan is for you. And that's what his commitment to you is. So I ask this question, are you willing to commit yourself to the commitment that God has made for you? Will you allow him to do these things in your life? Let's go a little bit further. Let's go back into the book of Psalm. Psalm verse 90, or chapter 90, excuse me. Verse 17, Psalm 90, verse 17. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So not only are we committing to the the plans that the Lord has for us, but we're also committing to allowing him to establish the work of our hands. We're allowing him to establish the work of our hands. What did Proverbs 16.3 say? Commit the Lord to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. How many of us truly are so committed to the Lord that we allow him to establish the work of our hands? That fact is so humbling that when we we truly do allow him to establish the work of our hands, I'm one of those, I want everyone around me to know the Lord. I want to ask that really tough question. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Is Jesus Lord of your life? 
I want to ask all of those difficult questions. I want to ask the question of everyone I encounter. If you die today, will you go to heaven or will you go to hell? Or do you have any idea? And when they say, well, I hope I go to heaven, I want to ask them a whole more bunch more questions. But you see, in our commitment to the Lord, there is also discipline. Not the Lord, well, there's discipline from the Lord as well when we do wrong. But there's a discipline that says, okay, it's not my heart's desire, but it is the desires of the Lord. So when I walk into a truck stop, I walk into... Such a place as yesterday where I unloaded three men joking about three other trucks that were supposed to be there to unload at the same time I was, but were stuck, got stuck on the way there in snow drifts on a back road that they were assigned to take. And then to yesterday morning as the temperatures warmed, that snow began to melt. And the road turned into a muddy, muddy mess. Not only were they still stuck in snow drifts, but they were stuck also in the mud. And these three men found it humorous. They were laughing and joking about it. Folks, that is the road that I was at first assigned to travel. But that was changed Friday afternoon. And I was re- rerouted to a different road into this gold mine because of those three trucks having been gotten stuck. Praise the Lord that I was rerouted. But here on this route to meet new people, I was so excited. I was determined that I'm going to introduce these people to the Lord. these three men that were doing the unloading. There was not one mention made of the Lord. Not one mention made of the Lord. Why? Because that was not God's plan. That was not God's plan. And if I was not committed to the Lord and following His plan and having the desires only of my own heart, I would have been blurting out the name of Jesus. I would have been talking about this and that and other things about the scripture to these men. And I would have been out of turn, out of the desire of God's heart. So I let the Lord Establish the work of my hands. Do you? That's just an example. And that's how I live. Hebrews 11.30. Hebrews 11.30 says this. By faith the walls of Jericho fell. After the army had marched around them for seven days. Which leads us to another story. We turn back to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in the front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up. Everyone straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, Advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets 
before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the Ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua had commanded the army, Do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling at once. Then the army returned to camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. Verse 15. On the seventh day they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in the house shall be spared, because she has hit, she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble upon it. All the silver and gold and all the, all, all the articles of bronze and the iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. Now, verse 20. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and the sound of the trumpet, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. How is this story relevant to a commitment to the Lord? Think about this for just a moment. Joshua told the Israelite army to march around the city for six days, one time per day. Each morning for six days, you're going to march around it. You're not to say a word, just March in this order, and the trumpets will be blasting. Well, that would be pretty exciting on day one, right? Oh, this is cool. Well, day two comes around. They do the same thing. They go back to camp wondering, well, what, what is this all about? Day three comes, and they're wondering, what is this all about? Day four, day five, day six. You think they had trouble getting up and going on day five and day six? Do you think their commitment to the Lord was beginning to wane? Be less? Why are we doing this, Lord? Do you think they began to ask questions? Do you think they began to doubt? Do you think Satan was beginning to have a foothold in their lives? Many of us may feel as though we're marching around the city of Jericho. We don't know what God's plan really is. Even though he has told us what that plan is, we cannot see it because it's bigger than our imagination. It's more than we can fathom. It's more than our infinite minds can understand. You see, because God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. So, so often we find ourselves living in confusion. Yes, I want to stay committed to the Lord, but I don't understand what this commitment is about. I don't know why he's having me do this. I don't know why I can't do this. I don't understand. What happened on day seven? Just as Joshua had told the people, they marched around once, just like the previous six days. Then they marched around again in the same way. Then they did it a third time, and then a fourth time, and then a fifth time, 
and then a sixth time. Do you think the excitement was beginning to build? Because they had been told that on the seventh day, the city would be handed over to them. Are you willing to stay committed? Would you walk around the city of Jericho seven times on the seventh day? Or would you have just had more of a desire to just stay in bed that day? Stay home, not do what the Lord has, has asked. And on that seventh time around, when that particular trumpet blast sounded and the Lord and the army of the Israelites shouted out the walls of Jericho fell. Now you may be saying, well, what a wonderful story. That's Old Testament stuff. That's not happening today. I want to go back just prior to this story into chapter 5. We pick up the story in verse 11 of chapter 5. So the Israelites have crossed over the Jordan, right? That's what they're going to go into battle against Jericho for. They've been commanded by the Lord that this is your possession. This is the promised land. So they've crossed over the Jordan. Now they have a time of, of the Lord's commands of circumcision of, of the younger men. Remember, they've been wandering in the desert for 40 years. So now the, the young men who are of age to be in the army have not been circumcised, which was a commandment of the Lord in the Old Testament. That is not a commandment of the Lord in the New. So there was a time of circumcision of these, these young men. And as they healed, they stayed in this region. Not far from Jericho. in a place called Gilgal. Verse 10 says, On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land. For the first time, they ate some of the produce of this land, of the promised land. What had they been eating before? The same thing they'd been eating for 40 years. Okay? The day after the Passover, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. Verse 12, the manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year, they ate the produce of Canaan. So just days before they march around the city of Jericho, the provision that God had given them for 40 years as they wandered through the desert, this provision of their daily manna, our daily bread. We say that in a prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day. Now, I'm not saying that all in order. Give us this day our daily manna, our daily bread. So here, something new has occurred in the life of the Israelites. They've crossed the Jordan. They're now in the promised land. They've celebrated the Passover. They've fulfilled the commitment of the Lord or the command of the Lord. They've remained committed to him to do his will. 
and they eat for the first time the produce of the land. And God's provision of the manna is taken away. In their hearts, I can't foresee that they're truly celebrating as they march around the city of Jericho. In their hearts, they may be saying, why are we doing this? The the Lord just took his provision from us. That daily bread. Why are we doing this? This doesn't make sense. Folks, I bring all of this up because staying committed to the Lord, we don't always understand what he has us doing. We don't understand his plan. We don't understand his reasoning. But that doesn't mean that we should not stay committed. It means we should stay committed all the more. We go back to the book of Psalm. Chapter 1, verse 1. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. Excuse me. Or stand in the way that sinners take. Or sit in the company of mockers. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And who meditates on his law day and night. Are you counted among these? It says blessed is the one. Who does not walk in step with the wicked. Are you walking in step with the wicked? Surely you're not. Blessed is the one who does not stand in the way that sinners take. Surely you're not standing in the way that sinners take. Blessed is the one who does not sit in the company of mockers. Surely you're not sitting in the company of mockers, are you? Folks, we're surrounded by these types of people. We live among these people. They're in our household. They're in our workplace. I stood in the company of three mockers yesterday, mocking the three truck drivers and their trucks that were stuck in the mud. Mocking them, making fun of them, insulting them. Verse 2, blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord. Blessed is the one who meditates on his law day and night. You see, folks, if we are not meditating on his law, on his word day and night, our commitment to him is less than ideal. Our commitment is kind of like the waves of the ocean. It's going up and it's going down. We're being tossed around like a tiny ship in the big old ocean. Verse 3. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Who's that person? The blessed one. Who does not walk in in step with the wicked. Who does not stand in, in the way of the sinner's take. Or sit in the company of mockers. But the blessed one who delights in the law of the Lord. And who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water. Which yields its fruit in season. And whose leaves do not wither. I want to share one more story that I read here in the last few days, dealing with commitment. I can't say that this is on my bucket list, but I think if I ever had the opportunity to do it, I, I just might take it. I just might, just might do it. I'm not, I'm not sure. There would be a, a real test of my faith. But the story was about Uh, an individual who went skydiving for the first time. 
many of us have seen video of how they're all bundled up. They've got their parachute they, and they step to the doorway of this airplane and maybe on the count of three, maybe by the push of someone behind them, whatever it might be. When we look at our military um, parachuting out of the back end of a of a huge airplane, they just walk forward. They, they just take their turn. It's without fear. It's just boom, 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 boom. And they're, they just walk right out the plane. But this, this individual stood there and he held tight to the doorway as, as the air was trying to suck him out. And he finally let go of the doorway and out the doorway he flew tumbling through the air, totally disoriented, didn't know up from down, left from right. But he remembered one thing. Pull the cord. And he pulled that cord and woof, his parachute filled with air. And he began to glide through the air at 5,000 feet above the surface of the earth. Folks, that's a commitment. He was committed to go on skydiving. But there was a hesitation. There was a hesitation there in the doorway. And that's where many of us are in our commitment to follow the Lord because he may take us skydiving. He may take us to places where we don't want to go. He may have us meet people that we don't ever want to meet. But our commitment helps us to follow through with what God's will for our life is. So are you clinging to the doorway? Folks, to let go of that doorway, it takes trust in God and it takes faith. For the walls of Jericho collapsed by faith. How strong is your faith? Let go of the doorway, folks. Let door, go of that doorway. And the person who lets go to stand in commitment to the Lord is like a tree planted beside streams of living water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. And we close this morning by going back to Proverbs 16. We read verse 3 at the beginning. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. Now we skip down to verse 9 as we close. In their hearts, humans plan their course. But the Lord establishes their steps. Will you take that step of faith? Will you walk, march around the city of Jericho? Will you take your position in the battle that the Lord calls you to? What's your response? What's your commitment? to the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this message. Thank you for those who hear this message and may their lives be eternally changed because of it. No, Lord, there's no altar call. No, Lord, there's no sharing of the gospel. But as you have told us in Scripture, we are to evaluate 
evaluate ourselves based upon the scripture. Test ourselves to see if we're in the faith. We're not to compare ourselves to anyone else. Other than you, Lord. Other than you. So thank you for this message. And may our time left here on this earth, however long it may be, be spent in a commitment to you as we live and flourish in your word. like a tree planted beside streams of living water. May we produce the fruit that comes from the presence of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. We love you, Lord, and may we stay committed to you as we honor you who remains committed to me and to us. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.